Love it. Boom that. <laughs> I don't know where that is. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, the whole afternoon I was thinking about something that Andy said earlier, that they don't have uh, normally here all the riffraff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, I, I kind of qualify for this term, <laughs> at, at least for the old part. Yeah. Uh, and I know at least one person who would agree on the riffraff, that's the ex-minister of uh, antiquities in Egypt, my favorite nemesis, Dr. Zahi Hawass. Uh, it's a pleasure to follow the speakers. Uh, I enjoyed the talk so far, and I usually like to talk in the morning because uh, at least I don't have to uh, match these uh, good speakers. But I'm very happy that Graham Hancock is following me because uh, at least I don't have to follow Graham Hancock, who's uh, a great colleague of mine. I don't know if he's in the stage today at the moment. Grant, are you there? Uh, <clears throat> I usually uh, kick off my talks. Uh, that's a blatantly self-promotion picture, OK? I mean, it's nothing to do with my talk. Uh, in fact, I was challenged to come wearing Speedos. Uh, <laughs> but I thought the weather isn't. I'll spare you the, the troll. Uh, I usually start my talks these days for various reasons on cosmology, or rather the, uh, the beginning of the beginning. Uh, we tend to forget, uh, all of us sitting here, that uh, we all are part of a much greater uh, origin. Uh, and indeed, uh, we're I like to quote the phrase of Carl Sagan, it always sticks in my head when I speak about these things. Uh, <clears throat> we are star stuff. Uh, we're literally made of star material. Uh, everybody sitting in this room, this, uh, this microphone, my cup of coffee, everything is made of star stuff. Uh, I suppose we can add uh, a bit more to this, with star stuff become conscious. And I always like to remind people of this, because whenever we talk about the ancient past, our ancient origins, and so forth, we kind of stop uh, somewhere in prehistory, and we're going down to 10,000 BC. And, but there's a long process that, uh, that brought us here, uh, literally here, in the forefront of existence. Everybody sitting in this room is in, right in the front wave of a process that began for and a half billion years ago. So having said this, let me go through a sort of timeline because I'll bring you to the point. And uh, there's, there's behind there somebody called Julian. He's a guardian angel and he's going to help me with my slides. Because I discovered there's two types of people in this world. There's the Max, the Macintosh people, <laughs> and then there's the PC people. Yeah. And we're forming two sort of groups. We're probably going to have a Mac party soon, a PC party. Uh, there is also the speedos and the anti-speedos, but I won't talk about this. <laughs> but uh, I have PC and they have Mac, so we have to adjust all this. So I'm hoping that the first slide I talk is going to be... Oh, there we are. Uh, I don't know if some of you remember, but four years ago or five years ago, the National Geographic, the most prestigious uh, institution of exploration in the world, I guess, uh, had this uh, on the cover page. Suddenly, it was okay to talk about are we alone in this, uh, in this great universe. And the reason they did that, they felt comfortable to bring out this discussion. Uh, I keep referring myself with Graham, but we did survive uh, 20 years of this business, and there was a time when you didn't use the two A words. You didn't say Atlantis, and you didn't say alien. If you did that, you were sort of intellectually crucified and then burnt at the stake. So uh, it seemed it was okay to speak about the possibility of uh, life outside our, our, our solar system. And the reason they did that, of course, is because this was the time when we were beginning to get evidence of exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. 
And uh, unless I'm mistaken, today we have something like 3,500 exoplanets, that means planets beyond our own solar system, uh, revolving around stars within our galactic system. Uh, I'm saying this because this is where our story begins. Our story begins even before our galactic system starts. Some, sometime 14 and a half billion years, take or, take or leave a few million years here and there. 14 and a half billion years, it's frightening when you think about it. Uh, there was an infinitesimally, absolutely, incredibly, unthinkably small particle that blew up the Big Bang and generated energy and matter. And within a, a couple of million years, perhaps a billion years, we had this, uh, this uh, what you see there are uh, hundreds, there are billions of them, galaxies, islands of stars floating about in the expanse of, of space. Every speck you see here is a galactic system made up of billions of stars. Kind of spooky when you think about it. This is where we start. Oops. Julia? <coughs> Here's a, one of these galaxies. We usually see them uh, through powerful telescopes as flattened or disks. The reason is sometimes you see them on their side and other times you see them face on. Uh, it's a universe. It's one of the universes out there. Uh, here is one that you see face on. Uh, do, do I need to point somewhere? Uh, another one. And we get to a moment, we don't know exactly when, uh, sometime, perhaps around 10 billion years, uh, our galaxy, our own galaxy, which is the Milky Way, by the way, and in fact the reason you see this Milky Way in the sky, in case you are not into cosmology, and you see it as a band, is we're looking inside our own galactic system. It appears to us as a, as a band. And somewhere, sometime, uh, somewhere near the constellation of Orion, in fact in the so-called nebula, a very boringly called Nebula 42. Uh, but somewhere around there, it's supposed to be the nursery of stars. It's where stars in our galactic system are born. The nursery of stars. And from there, one particular star, whoops, I'm having this, the, the slides also going the wrong way, Julian, for some reason. Yeah, here is the, well, perhaps, well, you see the Milky Way there, we're actually looking inside the galaxy. Uh, <clears throat> here is a picture of our own galaxy, of course, we can't go out there to photograph it. A uh, picture of our own galaxy, and where it's marked Sol, the, the name of our sun, we're one of the suns. Uh, they estimate about 400 billion suns within this single galactic system, our own. And we're kind of somewhere two-thirds from the center, uh, but too small to show a little spot, a little planet out of nine planets, the third planet from the sun, as we all know. And recently, recently, uh, through the powerful telescopes that are available and various radio technology and so forth, a small, very small space, uh, it's shown there, but you can't see it with the slide. It's about, a, about an inch in, in this, this huge uh, picture, where we have detected so far 3,300 exoplanets, some of them very Earth-like. Uh, extrapolating from this, we think now that there is probably a billion, if not more, planetary system in our own galactic system. So it's okay. It's cool. To uh, use the word alien, okay? I, I went through a long about way to tell you this. It's kind of okay. I'm not going to talk about aliens, and uh, I'm not. Sorry, somebody clapping? Yes, everybody should clap. <laughs>
Alien is okay, all right? Uh, now, big question is, you know, I think the odds are, uh, many astrophysicists, I think most astrophysicists and cosmologists, I've met a few, I've been lucky to meet quite a few, uh, are quite okay with this. I mean, everybody would say that now the probabilities of extraterrestrial life is very, very high. The big question is whether it is intelligent life, and of course the huge question coming to ancient aliens, our favorite TV show these days, or the, the worst one you've ever seen, depends who you are, whether you're speedo supporters or anti-speedos, uh, is that, of course, huge question, not impossible, that maybe our planet is spawned either by an external uh, intervention or indeed visited by aliens. Why not? It's possible. We're now in the why not phase. And uh, having said this, what's interesting to me, uh, is a uh, a lovely planet it's a google picture it's amazing what you can do these days and you can travel around the world and fly and land on top of the pyramids and uh, i'm taking you to egypt i don't know but we're kind of jumping quite a bit here so well i'll take you there uh, i'm the guy on the on the right Right? <laughs> the one without the turban. <clears throat> Actually, I love this picture. I use it very often to make a point. Uh, the man is from somewhere in central Egypt. I was driving around taking pictures with a friend. And uh, we stumbled on this camel herder. He looks pretty old. Uh, what, what, what got me is that he, he had no idea, no idea how old he was. I uh, asked him how old you are, and he said, I don't know. He, he remembered vaguely that he was born sometime during the reign of King Fuad, so he must have been at least 90. Uh, but the reason I, I enjoyed uh, making contact is that he's almost likely a descendant from what I consider now the originator of the pharaonic civilization. What I wanted to do is to bring you to a point, which uh, the slides didn't quite make it for some reason, is that when we start our story with the origins of our galactic system and, and so forth, we reach a point where the Earth's system was formed. We know it's about four and a half billion years. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a cosmologist uh, last night. We're having dinner, and we both, you need to get into this, be exposed to this, but it, it begins to grab you that where we are now, this, this globe, has existed for four and a half billion years. And we appear on this, on this, on this globe uh, hardly as human <coughs> creatures or homo creatures, something like seven million years, perhaps a little bit more. And you and me and everybody else in this room, homo sapien, modern man, uh, begins something like 200,000 years ago in Central Africa, Central East Africa. I know there's a lot of debate on this, but I'm very convinced it's Central East Africa. And it's quite amazing for me to think that for billions, we're not talking billions, we're talking billions of years, this planet existed without us. We're very much newcomers here, very much newcomers. And therefore, I think, uh, for me, it is pretentious that we think we're going to solve the mysteries of the universe now. Uh, we have a long way to go. We're, we're very early visitors on this planet. Mm -hmm. Something happened, something happened 200,000 years ago. A woman, almost certainly uh, an African woman, probably of black skin, uh, gave birth to the first modern human. This is the mystery to me now. The question is, what caused that huge mutation, that extraordinary big jump from a primitive homo creature to modern man, homo sapien? Surely something happened. And this is, I think, going to be the big, big uh, breakthrough to understand what happened. And everything is possible. Everything is possible. They're, they're, they're now talking about things like uh, we've been spawned by uh, a comet that brought uh, life on this planet. Everything is possible. We, we live in a, in, a, in a cosmological time where everything is possible. It's very exciting for me. But I wanted to bring it to the point where the ancient Egyptians, amazingly, when you read their texts, and you read the pyramid texts particularly, they speak about the same origins. 
they actually say that they came from, a, from the stars. They say that they came from a specific group of stars. Their originator of the civilization was a, was a, a divine human called Osiris, with his consort Isis. I don't need to tell you the myth. I'm sure you all know it. Uh, they came from the stars, and they specifically say it came from the zone of the Orion constellation, of which we know was the nursery of stars. This, to me, is, has always haunted me. Uh, how did they... It's amazing that, that 5,000 years ago, intuitively, and to me this is something at my ripe old age I'm getting very much into. I think my colleague uh, Hancock is also has been thinking of these terms. Uh, he's approaching it from various other scientific ways, but I think we have a faculty that we've stopped using which is intuitive, intuitive thinking, intuitive knowledge. And I'm very convinced that we hold the knowledge of the universe within us. We are literally made of universe stuff, we start with the universe alive. And therefore the ancient Egyptians might have had, might have had a means to reach that knowledge. Uh, through initiation, through meditation, through rituals, I'm not so sure. Uh, one thing for sure is that they needed a hardware. And this comes very interesting. Very often I was asked today, uh, just before the lunch break, uh, uh, what do you think the pyramids are for? I'm always asked this, and I say, well, uh, you know, we're dealing with a very spiritual people, extremely spiritual people. This is very evident from the ancient Egyptians. And yet they needed this hardware, they needed these pyramids, and temples, and mummies, and... Uh, I'm not so sure how we can put it in terms of today, but I would say that the nearest thing to describe what these pyramids are for, and probably the temples as well, is that they are metaphysical machines. Uh, it sounds a bit sort of hairy-fairy, but in their mind, and probably, who knows, they did work, they intended these structures to convert a physical entity, a pharaoh, into a spiritual one. And not just that, but to send him somehow, and Andy was talking about this soul, um, soul holds, uh, and he showed the shafts in the pyramid, uh, somehow to send them back to their place of origin. Now, I leave this as to whether they succeed or whether it is possible or what. Uh, I, I suppose I'll go to my grave without knowing, but. Uh, it's a kind of eerie feeling, because they went to a lot of trouble to build this hardware, to build these machines, these, these metaphysical machines. Uh, I'm going to be dealing with one specific one, in fact, the earliest one. Uh, amazingly, with this one. Now, let's see. Um, Julian, I'll, I'll lead uh, number three. Julian? Ah, yep, he's there. <laughs> he's got wings and he's flying behind him. <laughs> I'll give him a second. Uh, <clears throat> well, while we're getting the image, uh, I'll be dealing with the famous... No, we'll, we'll go to the next one. I'm going to skip this. Okay. I'm going to skip this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. There. No, no, no. Not that one. It's called... Uh, the, 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 no, no, the one at the top. No, 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 no. no. That's my Vatican story. <laughs> Which, in case, I shouldn't be saying this, Andy's going to get upset, but I am giving a talk tomorrow at 6 o'clock at the Theosophical Society, if you want to come, it's on Gloucester Place, 50 Gloucester Place, about a book I wrote called The Vatican Heresy, but that's something else. Yep, that's the one. Can we go on slide book? No, no, no. You have to press. You're pressing. That's it. You got it. Julian? <laughs> Thank goodness for Julian. Believe me, I'm going to have a mess here. There we are. Okay, you're looking at a very strange thing, but before I get into that, we're going to talk about the earliest, or supposedly the earliest ever, architectural project in the world. It's the famous step pyramid complex of Saqqara. <coughs> uh, I'm showing you this because we need to understand something before I get into this, and I'm showing you a gyroscope. Uh, I was hoping it was going to turn, but we need to be on, on the net for it to do that, but you all know about gyroscopes or, or spinning tops, you know, they gyrate. Uh, in Egypt, I don't say this, I tell them a, a belly dancer and they get it, you know, like the belly dancer gyrates. 
very quickly, very quickly. Uh, we all know from our school days, and I'm not quite sure if you have engineers there or in your, in your group, uh, that we live on a, on a planet, it's a globe, it's a ball. Uh, we know it uh, revolves, it rotates, it rotates on its axis. We all know that, I hope. Uh, and we get the effects of night and day. We, we see this all the time. It revolves around the sun and we get the effects of the season. It revolves around 365 days and we come to this famous third motion, which is the precession motion. The planet, our planet uh, wobbles. Simple terms. It wobbles very, very slowly, like a spinning top, but extremely slowly in 26,000 years, give or take. And there's been huge debates as to whether the ancients were aware of this, whether the ancients knew about it, and whether they could calculate its rate. Uh, I believe they did. Uh, many astronomers today believe they did, but we're still facing the very resistant Egyptologists and Egyptologists in this gang. No? Good, I can have fun criticizing them. Uh, Egyptologists, uh, Egyptologists are, are rare as pandas. You never meet an Egyptologist, I met a few, but uh, they are very resistant to these ideas. But it's becoming more and more obvious that the ancient Egyptians, and we begin to see now with other ancient cultures, prehistoric cultures, Gobekli Tepe and others I will talk now in Egypt, that uh, knew. Uh, a very advanced astronomy, or a very advanced observation astronomy. You know, I was once told, I'm kind of going all over the place, but I'm having fun. Uh, I was once told by uh, Archie Roy, the, the, the Scottish astronomer, who said, you know, Robert, 5,000 5, years ago, 10,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, they were intelligent people, had the same brains. They were Newtons, they were Einsteins, they were, they were born at different times. So it's not at all strange to think that there were people there able to work out what we work out. They simply didn't have the technology we have and the science. But these things are observable. This is one of the things the Egyptologists have trouble understanding. We're talking about observation astronomy, things that you can see, I can see, and they could see. It's out there in the sky. Anyway, uh, next uh, slide, hopefully. Oh, there is the book. I'll be talking now. That's the talk. I'm giving you a preamble. This is a talk about Imhotep, the African architect of the cosmos. Uh, Imhotep, we, amazingly, I mean, we don't know who are the architects of some of the cathedrals. In fact, most of the cathedrals, we have no idea who are the architects. Many of the palaces that we have around in Europe, we don't know some of them who are the architects. Uh, many of the Roman vestiges, but we know the name of an architect, the architect, the very first architect that built the very first architectural project, and we know it was Imhotep. We know that because we found his name on the project itself. Apart from that, we know very little. Uh, I call him architect of the cosmos, but it doesn't come from me, it comes from the Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Loer, because he was now commissioned the very first pharaoh who commissioned that hardware I was talking about. And the commission must have been something like this. I want you to build me something in stone, and it's going to launch me to the stars. Sort of Cape Canaveral of the pharaohs. That's the commission. And we're going to see what he had in mind, how he kind of converted this, this, this metaphysical idea into a physical, visible, to, the, to this day. You can still go there and see it. Uh, I'm going to go through very quickly what happens over this period of precession, particularly with two, uh, with, with one star. I've picked up Sirius. It's written in Italian here. I, I apologize. It's from a talk I gave in Italy a couple of weeks ago. Sirio, the star Sirius. The star Sirius is the key to ancient Egypt. It was the star par excellence. It represented the goddess Isis. It marked, it was used for the calendar. It rose uh, at dawn during the Nile flooding. It was the star of, it was the star of rebirth. And therefore this star, this particular star, was associated and imitated for the rebirth of the pharaohs. 
Uh, you're looking at it, I'll put the date, well, 2012 AD, uh, last, last year, and it rises something like 20 degrees from due east of... I'm going to move a bit, so I can... Oh. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's better. Uh, due east, I'll put it on the side here, for the sake of the picture, and it's about 20 degrees from due east. If you go about 3000 BC, uh, roughly in the early stages of the pharaonic civilization, it would have been a further 7 degrees, about 27 degrees from due east. And you go further in time, about 6300, I put this on random, it's about 45 degrees from due east. Due east there, it moves, and it's very obviously moving because of this precession. What am I doing? I thought it was the curry I ate. I apologize. <laughs> I'm very cheeky. Uh, don't worry about my tongue. Something is happening, Andy. Okay. We reached the time of 10,500 BC, give or take a century, and it's now due south. It's now due south. And it's extremely... You see what happens if you observe it uh, now, at the meridian, you, if you look at due south, the stars, as you know, reach, uh, rise in the east, reach the high point due south, and then set in the west. When they reach the high point, today, Sirius would have been uh, something like 60 degrees up in the sky, sorry, 45 degrees up in the sky, looking from the latitude of Egypt. Uh, you go back down in time, and it literally goes down. And this is what happens. There you go. So clearly, uh, knowing that stars do this because of precession, it's observable. If you know that a monument is aligned to this particular star, for example, if they tell us, there's a spot here that gets this thing going. Uh, if you know that, for example, a temple is aligned to the star series because they say so, it's a description on, 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 the, on the monument, then you can date that temple. You can precess the sky backwards. We have the computer programs to do it. You can get these, by the way, I don't know if you have them. Everybody should have a computer program of astronomy. It's a thing these days. I recommend the Starry Night Pro. That's the cool one. It's very user-friendly, and you can precess skies. You can say, I want to see, uh, well, I want to see, I want to go to Gobelki Tepe. Here's the latitude. You, you press the, the, the position. Uh, you say, I want to go to 9,500 BC, as they were talking, and you can see. Uh, virtually, of course, but you can see what the people at the time saw in the sky. So you can literally examine what they were examining and you can make sense out of it. And I presume you did this, Andy, when you were studying the alignment and position of these, uh, these pillars. Uh, I'm going to take you on a, on a kind of uh, magical mystery tour of what happens over a long period of time. And we're going to start with Hotel. I'll be examining, I don't have a pointer, so I have to move around here. We're going to go from the Step Pyramid, which is in the north up there. Uh, we're going to go to a place called Napta Playa. This is the latest cool thing in Egypt. Okay, I have to hold it here, I guess. Sorry? So what do I have to do? Like that? No, your pointer in your hand. Ah, my pointer. My pointer. No? Nope. Well, anyway, we'll have to tolerate it. Um, so we'll, we'll be examining this, this range. Now, the reason I'm showing this is because Nafta Playa is a site that is very similar to Goberti Tepe. It's got roughly the same date. It was discovered in 1974. Uh, amazingly, it was not till until 1997, let me get this right, that they realized, it was studied by anthropologists, it took them a long time to realize that, that uh, it's a curse of the pharaohs, this, I mean, <laughs> why is it hitting me? <laughs> or maybe the goddess Elena or, or doesn't like me. Uh, the, uh, 
What was I saying? Yes. It's, it's when you have a site, like Ruben Kitepi at one stage, uh, examined by the, what well, we say the wrong people, I suppose the word isn't wrong, but the people who will not see what others would see. Because many of these ancient sites, in fact most of these ancient sites, particularly prehistoric sites, are related to astronomy, there's no doubt. Or, or rather, I would say sacred astronomy. Or religious astronomy, call it what you like. But they are usually aligned, they have astronomical symbols, as is becoming very obvious with Gobert Kitepi. This is a similar site. But it took them from 1974, anthropologists, to finally, finally say, well, we don't get this site. People could live here, like Gobert Kitepi, there was no signs of habitation. The stones all over the place, strange stone circles, uh, alignments. Let's get an astronomer. And they did get an astronomer, and he immediately realized it was an American astronomer called, uh, well, the name will come to me in a minute, uh, from Boulder, Colorado, and he immediately realized it was very obvious to him that uh, there were alignments to the solstices, there were alignments to star rising, and so forth. So we have that site there, and strangely enough, uh, to those who are in this Robert Kitepi research, you will see later on, as I get to this place, that they buried it's something we don't understand, and I think this is one of the mysteries of Gobert Kitepi, isn't it? That these places were actually covered. They weren't visible. You'll see that they actually covered their boulders. They, they dug holes and they put them in there. And we still haven't figured out what it's about. Uh, there we go. Now, one of the first... I can't, I can't cover the whole book. But I'll give you the main points. One of the things that was brought out in this book is why did Imhotep, Imhotep select a site that is what is today we call Sakar. It's about uh, 12 kilometers or so south of the Giza pyramids. And this is uh, a new way, by the way, a new way of chronological analysis. We use carbon dating, of course, but uh, Suspect sometimes. We use astronomy, like I said, we can use precession. Uh, <laughs> there must be something of this. Oh dear. Just get rid of the microphone. I think I'll get rid of the microphone. Can we do that? Uh, how do I switch this, this baby off? Julian? Okay, it's here. Yeah. I think my voice carries, no? Yeah. Ah, that's better. Uh, well, one of the new ways to date, and that's very new, nobody thought about this, is to decide what side should come before the other. For example, uh, Egyptologists will tell you that King Cheops, King Khufu, built the Great Pyramid because he wanted to have it on the highest promontory, overlooking the Nile Valley and impress everybody. Well, if that's the case, then why the earlier pharaohs did not use that site? It was available. In fact, Imhotep, uh, let's see, let's place him. We know that there was two sites pre-existing the pyramid field. We're looking at the zone, which is modern Cairo here. It's right at the end of the Nile proper. Uh, above the picture expands the delta, the famous delta, going to the Mediterranean. So we're looking at a zone which is Greater Cairo. In ancient times, or Egyptologists called this particular desert zone the Memphite Necropolis. This is where there are the pyramid fields. There are 25 royal pyramids there. And of course, the most famous are Giza. Here we've got that fifth the site. But before we get there, there were two sites we know pre-existed. One was Heliopolis the city of the sun, called it Anu, the city of the sun. And by the way, my talk tomorrow, in case you want to come, is actually about the city of the sun involving the Vatican. It's kind of a fun talk. <laughs> Somebody clap? <laughs> uh, Heliopolis, the city of the sun. This was the, uh, it was the Vatican of the ancient Egyptians, it was the, the center of initiation. This was where all the great high priests of Heliopolis, probably pharaohs themselves, uh, went to study. Uh, we, 
Greeks tell us that Pythagoras went there, and Solon went there, and probably even Plato went there, and Plato, the center, the epicenter of learning, initiated learning. And one of the things we know they did, one of the main things they did, the high priest of Heliopolis was called the chief of the observer, what today we would call the royal astronomer, if you like. He studied the sky. Uh, more than that, he observed the activities of the sky and he uh, advised the pharaoh of what to do. They had a kind of living, real astrology. They would look at the sky and they would interpret what was going on and they would do rituals in accordance to what was happening in the sky. A very interesting, very interesting concept because they built their whole, their whole culture on this. They had a system of law, a system of governing, a system of order, they called it, called mat. And the system was not a man-made system. They didn't follow dogmas and doctrines like we do with the church and so forth. It was governed by the sky. It's a beautiful way of running your country. A sort of astrological world. It's the sky that told them what was happening, what should happen, how the pharaoh should do. It's a beautiful concept. And indeed, <laughs> believe it or not, as strange as it might seem, I'm suggesting this to the Egyptians. I was born in Egypt, as you know, and Egypt is in a mess today. It's a big mess. And we're trying to revive this idea, this idea that you don't need to follow these dogmatic religions that that's causing all sorts of problems these days. We need to return to what is known as a magical natural religion. It's the big thing <coughs> these days. The talk among many philosophers, the magical, well, magic has its connotation, so let's call it the natural. We need to return to nature. We need to follow our ideologies through nature. We need to reconnect <coughs> rather than disconnect, which we've been doing over the last uh, 500 years. That's another story. There was another site called Etopolis, another sacred site. And what we has we become more and more aware of this, is that look what happens. Whoops, hello. Julian, <laughs> I think this is off. Uh, my thing is off working. My slides changer. Uh, it's coming out. Take your wings off, Julian. What's happening? I press. I, I press the button somewhere. All right. Uh, so we know first the opulence. Then Letopolis, and then Sakai. This is the very first archaeological uh, uh, architectural site. This is where Imhotep built his step pyramid. You'll see it in a minute. And he chose this uh, very high promontory, but it's nowhere near as dramatic as Giza. And then came Giza. Here you are, that's the location of Giza. Then came another pyramid site, the son of Khufu, by the way, the son of Cheops, the place, a pyramid, Abu Ruash. Unfortunately, it's been dismantled in medieval times, so there's only the part of the, the lower part. Oops. Oops, I want to show this progressively. <coughs> well, this will do it. What we are beginning to realize is that there is a geometrical, very striking geometrical patterns, very precise. You have, uh, I can't go to the point, but you can see that the Heliopolis and Etopolis are exactly on the latitude. They're very precise. And then Giza, down. Abu Rawash, 27 degrees. Now, 27 degrees perhaps doesn't mean anything to you. To an astronomer, immediately rise. 27 degrees, that's the rising point of the solstice. The sun of solstice looking in that direction, or the winter solstice sunset in this direction. This is how an astronomer picks up these messages. And then Giza, 45 degrees. The, the, the diagonal of the pyramid leads precisely to Heliopolis. What about this one? Wait. Yeah. You want me to use the mic? Yeah, but this mic is buzzing. Okay, I'll use the mic. Sorry, this is mine. We'll have this. Uh, I think the problem is, is the wandering about. 
It's the one thing about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have the various theories about why it's just for the long straight thing. Okay. Hello? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to stay like this. <laughs> it's very hard for me not to wonder about. I'm, I'm, I'm half Italian, partly Maltese, and partly Syrian. So you can imagine me standing here. It doesn't work. <laughs> but I'll try. Uh, look what happens. From Saqqara, you get the 16 and a half degrees leading to the first original points. Now again, what is 16 and a half degrees? Why is it, well, it seems like some sort of plan because the angle is the same. It kind of joins up again now with this other scheme of alignments. But again, an astronomer knows this, and of course an astrologist should know this, is that 16 and a half degrees is actually the slope of this pyramid at Saqqara. And therefore now we're getting to unlikely coincidence. What this suggests is that the sequence that we're looking is, according to digital, it is all wrong. It seems that they might have begun everything at Heliopolis and then at Saqqara. Saqqara was the point where everything seems to grow from. But to me, this is the fun part. The whole of the zone becomes a giant open air temple. And all these sites are still there. That means people living in this area today in Greater Cairo, unknowingly to them, ghosted in the ancient sites, is a giant temple. <coughs> and to me, this is exciting because what amazing thing for to be aware of this when you wander around Cairo. You're kind of navigating into a a giant open-air temple that to them was an image, a kind of replica, a kind of bringing down, a kind of as above, so below effect of their famous order, the, 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 the order of Matt. Uh -huh. uh, what you're seeing here is a 2000, year, a 2000 BC coffin lid, and we know, we know with certainty, that two groups of stars, one in the north, which is uh, the Big Dipper, there is no question about it being Big Dipper, you can see its form, it's clearly the, the so-called cloud that you call it here, the Big Dipper, uh, and on the other side is the star Sirius, represented by Isis, see her there, she was called Sepetet, and uh, the, 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 the black man standing there, or black skin, is Orion Osiris. Now, I'm showing you this because this is the key to understand these monuments. You're going to see in a minute how they tore down. Here you can see a very symbolic representation as the Egyptians did it in 2000 BC, and probably earlier, and the constellation itself. <coughs> And here's me in a very cold night. Uh, we actually, I've got a camera that can photograph them very nicely. Here it is. It's actually was taken in Italy, if you're interested. Very clear skies in central Italy. Uh, here is, uh, I'm having trouble seeing my own slide, really, but uh, here is the uh, actual photograph of the star Sirius rising. You see it at the bottom there? Uh, this is known as the heliacal rising of Sirius. Sirius would rise at a particular time at dawn after 70 days of invisibility, still does, except that at the time of the pyramid builders, it would rise sometime around the end of June, which would have been the summer solstice. And by sheer coincidence, it rose heliacally, it was reborn, as the Egyptians said, after 70 days of being in the underworld. It was reborn at a time when the Nile would begin to rise and begin its yearly flood. And uh, one can see very easily that it inspired them to associate the star to rebirth, to regeneration, regeneration of Egypt and, and eventually regeneration of humans, of the king. Above it is the constellation of Orion, you can see it there. Uh, yeah. 
Now, we know, we know that since the beginning of Pharaonic civilization, probably earlier, probably earlier, probably much earlier, as a matter of fact, there was a ritual called the uh, stretching of the cord. And I promised the lady there that I might make an association to something she's wearing on the head. As you can see uh, uh, in, a, in profile there, in the dark, is the shape of a woman. She's wearing a golden tiara and she has a stem sticking up with a seven-pointed rosette or star. It's not uh, the moving. Uh, the, uh, the idea being that the pharaoh and her, representing this goddess, of course, she's a high priestess of, of a temple, probably a temple of, uh, of Heliopolis, we're not sure, and she would perform a ritual uh, holding a staff. The king also holds a staff, and between the, the two rods or staff is a cord. And they would stretch this cord, hence the title of this ritual, the stretching of the cord, and the king would direct her and saying left a bit, right a bit, left a bit, right, because he's aiming at a star behind her. And he's aiming at a star in the Big Dipper. We know that for sure because they tell us in the text. This is not the ritual. I wanted to make a little point because the lady behind there is wearing a stand like this, but with a five-pointed star. Now, I don't know if you follow the star symbolism, but the, the five-pointed star is the star of Egypt. It, the first people to have a five-pointed star, and it's the star of Isis uh, when we... When the Egyptians wrote Isis, they put a five-pointed star and a little pyramid next to it. That's where we get the five-pointed star, by the way. And the one you put on your Christmas tree, if it's five-pointed, it comes from there. Uh, the reason I'm saying this, because I'm trying to tempt you to come to my talk tomorrow, is that she's wearing a seven-pointed star. And that is because she's representing the stars that the king is aiming, which is the, the, the Big Dipper or the Plow, which has seven major stars, seven stars. And you'll see that the, the, the monuments, because I'll be talking about the Imhotep monument, is that she's, he's aiming at those stars because the pyramid has seven tiers. It's a step pyramid. Uh, the seven and the five has a strange meaning today. Um, you are all aware, although we're in a Protestant country, that there's a new pope in Rome, yes? Say, uh, pope Francis, the cool pope. The, the, uh, amazingly, amazingly, he announced his coat of arms uh, when he was uh, inaugurated. And the coat of arms had a five-pointed star. And it was explained by the Vatican that this represented the, the Virgin, which is, in fact, true. And you see many uh, representations of the Virgin having five-pointed stars on, on her robe and so forth. But then, amazingly, amazingly, it's never been done before in the papacy. A few weeks later, they decided that, no, they're going to change this star. And they now have an eight-pointed star. They didn't go for seven, they went for eight. And that is amazingly strange. It never happened. There's been a lot of talk about this on, among cardinals and why did they do this. There is a reason. But if you want to find the reason, come tomorrow at my talk. There you go. Uh, I'm showing you this because this is probably, almost certainly, what Imhotep did when he set out his famous pyramid complex. And this is a, an actual depiction of the uh, stretching of the cord. I'm going to take a quick look at my watch because I usually tend to overshoot. Uh, I can't even remember when I started. How much time do I have? Hey, Andy? Somebody? George, would you go back for a second? Yeah, um, if you go for another uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, we'll have to overshoot. This is the picture. That's actually how it's represented symbolically, of course. You'll find this is from the temple of uh, Phila. Uh, in many of the temples, they show this, this ritual, obviously. And here we have inscriptions explaining what they do. And here is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is always represented upright. And they saw it not as a dipper or a plow. They saw it as the thigh of a, of a cow or a bull. They call it the thigh, literally the thigh. And the bottom star is the hoof of the, of the leg of the time. Well, a strange name given by the Arabs called Al-Qaeda. Here is the Saqqara complex, seen from a Google picture. The square that you see in the middle is the step in the complex. Here it is looking north. Here is, uh, I'll have to move fast because I have, but uh, we'll get to the meaty part. Uh, 
Just by curiosity, how many people have been there? Wow. I'd say about 30% of you. Well, you know what I'm talking about. But for those who haven't been there, it's, it's the most amazing place. Um, to me, every time I go there, I think this is impossible. It's, it's the very first architectural project. It has features that are very stunning. Some parts of it look like it's new. Uh, particularly these uh, so-called symbolic buildings. They're, they're kind of mummy, uh, dummy buildings. They, did, they were built like a theme park. They weren't used. They were actually part of a ritual. Uh, here is uh, the, the complex in, uh, in a model form. It's there at Sakara, by the way. I use it for uh, when I take guests I, to explain what, what goes on there. And more importantly, to explain what the most important feature is not the pyramid itself. It's very dramatic. It's, it's six tiers and probably with a seventh pinnacle, hence the seven stars. But it's the boundary wall. And it's one of those things, again, that was left unchecked simply because they saw it as a wall. Egyptologists saw it as a wall. It's a very fancy wall. It's, it's amazingly large. You see pictures of it. But that's it. It was a wall. But to an astronomer, it begins to be something else because we know that the whole complex is aligned to the cardinal directions, east, west, north, south, like most of the pyramids. But there is something else. <coughs> Egyptologists have long said that Imhotep made a mistake. All other pyramids are aligned fairly, fairly well towards the north, due north. The Great Pyramid is about 5% one, five of a single degree aligned to, to astronomical north. That's how precise it is. This one is four and a half degrees. It's a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake. I don't think he made a mistake. You see why. I think it's deliberate. And we have to guess, try and find out why. So we have this four and a half anomaly deviation. And then there is the most bizarre, those who have been there will know what I'm talking about, there's the most bizarre structure on the north side of this pyramid. The pyramid is seven, six tier that you've seen. And each tier is inclined 16 and a half degrees. 16 and a half degrees inclination. Trying to work this one out. And there's a strange cubicle. They call it a serda. It's an Arabic word. It means a wine cellar. But in fact, we don't, the Egyptians call this a... Um, well, we call it a serda. We don't know the name. But it's, it's a magical room, if you like. And it is leaning, literally incorporated on the first tier. In, in other words, it's slow. It's inclined to 16 and a half degrees. And therefore, we have this strange structure, inclined 16 and a half degrees, and deviated 4 and a half degrees. And what? There is me, actually, leaning against the structure. And it's got these two peep holes. It's two holes. And it's very obvious that they were intended to look out, because they're still there, although it's a, it's a replica. They've got the statue. Here is what you see. Let me know. If you look through one of the peepholes, you see actually an effigy of the king, King Joseph of the Third Dynasty, the one who commissioned Imhotep. And he's there seated on a, on, a, on a throne, and he's there forever looking through these peepholes. He's looking at somewhere in the sky. He's looking at somewhere in the sky at four and a half degrees deviation, 16, and we can actually mark the X that he's looking at. There he is. Uh, that's the statue, the original statue of the Cairo Museum now. That's me measuring. I need to, I love telling anecdotes, but we don't have time. But this is, I take this picture because I actually had to go and measure this myself. And not only measure myself, but I had to bring astronomers to confirm my measurements because we have a problem when we do these things. One Egyptologist said 13 degrees, another one said 17 degrees, the third one said 14 degrees, and I didn't know which one to take. So far, I want to measure it, and I can guarantee you it's 16 and a half degrees, but when I published it, I got letters from Egyptologists saying, no, Mark Lehner says it's 13 degrees. And I replied that, don't care if the archangel says it's 13 degrees, it is 16 and a half degrees, but I measured it. And there you are, it's all confirmed with measurements. We went to, oops. There's another strange thing about this. Uh, this is very new, by the way. Uh, recently, uh, well, I say recently, in the 60s, but now it's taken seriously. The complex that you see, I have a feeling the slides are not in order. 
But anyway, since you've got this picture, the complex is marked in blue. That's where the boundary wall is. That's what you see today. You see part of this boundary wall. What was noticed from aerial pictures, which we didn't have in the early days of the 20s, uh, in the 60s, some people took aerial photography. They were examined with very high resolution later on, and they found that there was a moat all around the site, a giant moat. If, if you actually walk around it, you're walking around four kilometers. It's enormous. Uh, it doesn't show it on this picture. It's about 20, sorry, about 40 meters wide. It's probably twice the width of this, this, this room, if not more. And it was apparently 25 meters deep. That means the excavation alone to make this moat, this, this, this canal around, must have been around 9 million tons. The weird thing is we can't find the material. And it disappeared. There was enough material taken out of this moat to build a great thing and more. So we have these great mysteries in this, this place. Uh, but anyway, this is what the guy in the cubicle, the pharaoh, is doing. He was looking through, and he's marked forever the star that he had fixed with this priestess, which was one of the stars of the Dipper, not surprisingly. But what happens is when that star strikes this X in the sky, this 14 and a half degrees and 16 and a half degrees altitude, this point, what happens precisely at this point is the star series is rising. In other words, the whole complex is locked into the rising of Sirius forever. Well, forever, as long as you maintain this precession angle. Sooner or later, it will return to there because of precession. It's a genial idea because now we understand that the star series is the key to his design. He's trying to create a machine that works with, machine, with the activities of the sky. There's the wall. Whoops. It's gigantic. It's very impressive. It's about nine meters high. There's one where I'm standing. Nope. Never mind. I think there's one I'm standing near. near. Uh, and you realize very quickly, I mean, this is amazing architecture for it being the very first architecture ever in the world. It's really amazing. Uh, to any architect who looks at this, it doesn't need to be a rocket engineer to say this, this uh, long process of learning here. It doesn't simply come like that. But what's stunning about this is these so-called bastions. This is the main entrance. There's only one entrance, by the way, to the whole uh, boundary wall. There is a, there is a very good uh, there. That's how it must have looked. So you get these bastions shooting out and these cuts. The cuts are about seven meters high. Something about these cuts for a construction engineer, which I am, very intriguing. They were actually cut on location. They weren't blocks prepared. They were actually cut on location. They're seven meters high, and every single one is perfectly vertical. We checked this. It's unbelievable that you can do this by hand. You feel like there's a machine cutting this thing. But that's not the point I want to make, because the bastions and the cut is the key. And, uh, whoop. The, the, well, I'm getting the slides wrong, but uh, here's the boundary wall we constructed. You've seen a model of it. And there is a so-called false door. Immediately, well, we know the complex is roughly aligned to the cardinal direction. It's a, it's a rectangle. It's very obvious. And there are these 14 false doors. 14 false doors. Now, immediately, we know this from the myth as well. Uh, Osiris was supposed to have been cut in 14 pieces when he was killed by his brother. But to an astronomer, 14 means something astronomical. It is the cycle of the moon. It is 14 days of waxing and 14 days of waning. So already we smell astronomy here. But then, like uh, Julian behind there, there is always, a, I, I know Graham coined the term, we call them library angels. Suddenly, somebody in the library, for some reason, sends us a document. And I got this one from a French librarian. And he said, I saw this. Maybe you'll be interested in this drawing. And immediately, I'll have it a bit, a bit larger here. There we are. Immediately, I saw the numbers. Having studied ancient astronomy, it jumped on me. If you look at the top one. It's 1,461. It's the west wall. The bottom one is 1,458. 
And the two others are twice 366 and twice 366. See that? Well, 366 should ring a bell a bit with you guys because we have this, the, the year of 365 and of course the leap year of 366 days. When you observe a star rising at dawn, you will see it for three years rising on the same day, 365, 365, 365, and on the fourth year, it misses a day. You need an extra day, that's because of the true solar year, which is a quarter of a day, just about a quarter of a day more. So immediately, we have these, and that is what the star Sirius does. He's building a kind of numerical code here. But what of the other big ones? The other big numbers. Now again, some of you may know this from uh, your reading, that 1,461 is alarm bells to an astronomer who study ancient Egypt. It's known as the Sotic Cycle. The Egyptians did not adjust their calendar of 365 days. They had them from, the calendar exists from very early days. They didn't add a day. They let the calendar drift. Every four years, it took an extra day. It would take four times 365 and a quarter to return back to its point of origin. You multiply this 365 days and a quarter, you get 1,461, known as the Sotic Cycle. In other words, the Egyptians had the calendar as we know it. They had the, the, the days, the, the weeks, although the weeks were 10 days. They had a month of 30 days. They had the year of 365, and they had the great year of the Sotic Cycle of 1,461. It's there. But that is the calculated, the calculated 365 point a quarter multiplied by four, you get this figure. It is not the observable one. It varies slightly every cycle. The cycle before Imhotep, and that is checked by our astronomers, by astronomers, was exactly 1458, which is the number below. Cannot be a coincidence. This man knew astronomy like astronomers know astronomy today, observation astronomy. And he's marking it, he's designing it, he's blocking everything with the motions of this star on long term. He's trying to tell us something, there's something there, there's a message, there's something to the code. He's speaking astronomical language, speaking mathematics, numbers. This is what the Great Pyramid does. I was asked before, one of the great mysteries, we talk about this and that and it's science and it's... The great mystery of the Great Pyramid is the fact that it does not have hieroglyphs. It does not speak in the language that we expect it to speak from ancient Egyptians. Ancient Egyptians put hieroglyphs everywhere, indeed in other pyramids. They put them in temples. You go to Egypt, it's loaded with hieroglyphs. From bottom of the wall to top of the wall, on pillars. They love to write. And yet the greatest monument ever does not contain one single inscription. There are graffitis, I know, I don't want to get into that, but this is very debatable because it does not speak the language of the time. It's speaking what <coughs> I would call today, and any scientist would call today, a universal language. Mathematics, astronomy, and ratios. When something speaks like that, you can understand it, I can understand it, Chinese can understand it. 5,000 years ago, they can understand it, and they can understand it in another galactic system. It is the universal language that we communicate with anyway, forever. That's what's interesting about this way that they're expressing themselves. We're not talking about superstitious people designing tombs and they're, they're speaking a language here. And this is the big trend nowadays with new researchers. We're trying to understand what they're studying. Well, here, very interestingly, is giving us two major sotic cycles. Two major sotic cycles. You add these two. I'm not going to go into that. Whoops. Anyway, we're skipping here. If you add these two, you get, now, the moat, remember I showed you the moat? The moat is known to Egyptologists who have been there from the first dynasty. In other words, it preceded the design of Imhotep. This moat is dated to about 3000, 3100 BC, the very first dynasty. If you add this two sotic cycle, you get 6100, 6019, give or take. You get that date. Is there something at that date? Is there something at that date? And sure, there is. And there's a Gobekli Tepe in Egypt, it's called Naphtapli. There it is, I'm standing next to one of the circles. This site has been dated astronomically, has been dated carbon dating to 6100 BC. 
It probably was earlier when people went there, but they are lying. It's a, an astronomical site of Gobei uh, Tepi, and it screams the date 6100 BC. I'll have to move fast. Here I am, there. It's a very remote site, by the way. Clearly astronomical. This is only part of it. We're looking at solar clocks. And, uh, here's the strange things for, for Andy or whoever is studying this. Go back to Tepe. Here is the strange boulders that we, they actually had, we found them underground. <coughs> Couldn't see them. And they're actually carved by human hands. There's no doubt about it. This is known as the cow stone. It's now been removed, and here it is. Oops. Here, it's now at the uh, Nubian Museum. And uh, it, the site has only been excavated maybe 10, 20%. There's still a lot more, like Uber there's still a lot more to do here. Here is an, uh, the, the actual line. And the strangest thing of all is this. The Great Pyramid, as you may know, I, uh, unfortunately, I have to skip this, has shafts. The shafts point to the south, to Orion, and Sirius, Sirius, and on the other side, the Big Dipper. We know this. It's been known for a long time. The alignments you see here are pointing to Sirius, Orion's belt, and the Big Dipper. Exactly what the pharaohs did thousands of years later at the pyramids. There's no doubt at all now. Oh, dear. I've got a mic going. I've got coffee on my feet. <laughs> I, I might as well dance, you know. <laughs> I'm having fun. Are you having fun? Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. The astronomy that is extracted from this site, 6100 BC, was done later at the pyramids. This is the language. We're connecting sites using astronomy. Astronomy is the key. Mathematics is the key. There's going to be a new archaeology, and they have to get into this whether they like it or not. I've been screaming like this for 25 years. You have to use observational astronomy. You have to analyze this site with astronomy, and you have to look at their symbolism and numbers, because these people speak the universal language. I don't know why. Some people say aliens. I'm not going to that. But they speak the universal language. There's no doubt about it. So we really are dealing with something very important here. And they went to a lot of trouble doing this stuff. And it's there for us to investigate. And we will be seen in a thousand years, if we still exist, as people who have been really silly about this because we label them as tombs, as, as, as primitive sites. There is a message coming from a very distant past. And it's speaking the language that you and I can understand and anybody can understand anytime, anywhere in this universe. God. Here is an actual photograph. I'm going to skip the alliance because I think Andy is going to shut me up in a minute. And we go to the site of Dendera. 6,000 years, sorry, I'm going to say 3,000 years later. Am I right? 6,000 years later. 6,000 years later. And they did the same astronomy. And this is a fact because it's acknowledged. I'll show you a picture. There we are. Amy Sears to the east and naming at the Big Dipper to the north. They're doing the same thing over 6,000 years distance between them, the pyramids. They're speaking a language. We're looking at it all wrongly. I'll have to stop here because I have a feeling Andy is getting very nervous. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it.